Okay, we are live. It is Friday, April 9th, um, Senate Government Operations. And um, what we're gonna do today, committee, is uh, a couple things. We're going to um, hear in, I never can remember the act number. I can remember it was S-124, but I don't remember the act number. We uh, requested a bunch of uh, reports to come back. Um, some were official reports and <coughs> some were just to report to us um, on different aspects. And two of those um, were, a, there was usually a lead um, agency or organization that would um, lead the discussion. And two of them were assigned to the AG's office. And the those two were, um, because Julio had talked with us before about different um, different forms of um, citizen oversight committees and citizen um, review committees, and and we need we felt we needed to be very careful instead of um, designing any kind of a model to look at what the different types are because different types might fit better into different. Um, types of communities. A small community without a police port force might have a very different one than than Burlington that has a um, is a city with a its own police force. So uh, Julio had talked to us a little bit about some of those before, and so we just asked him to come back, having done some research and to look at it, and then this is something that hopefully we can get out to to the communities so that they can, um, and I think the LEAB was involved in different people. Um, so we're going to hear about that progress. And then we're going to, the other thing that was assigned to uh, as the AG, as the lead, was whether or not there should be a <coughs> central reporting point for um, allegations of misconduct by law enforcement officers. And if so, where that should live? Should it be in the AG's office? Should it be with the council? Should it be with the academy? So um, anyway, that's, and then how much of that should be public and when should it be public and all that information. So those are the two that we're going to hopefully hear a little bit more about today. And then at, I believe it's two o'clock, we're going to do um, a walkthrough of the code of ethics and hopefully vote out uh, H-135. So any questions, committee? All right. So Julio, thank you for joining us. Good to see you. Good afternoon. And um, so do you want to just take it away? Okay, thank you. So for the record, I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an assistant attorney general, uh, director of the civil rights unit. Uh, there, there, uh, Madam Chair, there are a few members of the committee who um, I, don't, I don't think have heard me testify before. Is it, do you want a little bit of background about my work in policing oversight or just proceed to sure. the- Sure, yeah, no, that would, be, that would be great. And um, do you know everybody here? We, we, I figured yes. you probably did. Yes, I've met them before in different contexts, but um, several members here, I haven't talked on, on the subject of policing before at all. Okay. Okay, great. Well, sure. So a little background of uh, information about your background would be helpful to the committee, I believe. Okay. So I moved to Vermont in 2004 from Los Angeles. Um, after graduating from law school, I practiced as a lawyer in Los Angeles doing employment, labor, and civil rights work. Um, my first work in the area of police reform began in November of uh, 1991. Um, when there was a series of shootings of African American and Latino uh, community members by the LA County Sheriff's Department, which at the time was the fourth largest law enforcement agency in the country. Um, it's as large as the LAPD uh, in terms of uh, patrol and, and, and uh, policing functions. And it also runs the uh, LA County Jail, which is the largest jail in the country, uh, in the West really, um, with about 23,000 beds. Wow. It's a big organization. And I was asked to be part of a six-month study of the LA County Sheriff's Department top to bottom to look at issues of use of force, citizens' complaints, accountability, and the like. Uh, at the time, 
This was an apartment that was facing allegations of severe beatings of chained prisoners of white supremacist gangs within the, the agency itself. Um, the outcome in July of 1992, which was two months uh, after the LA riots following the initial acquittals of Rodney King, there was a report with about 275 odd recommendations for reform. The LA County Board of Supervisors, which funds the Sheriff's Department, um, decided to create uh, basically the, the country's first police monitor. And we'll talk about monitoring models for oversight, um, but they created an office of mo monitor. At the time they called it the Office of Special Counsel because it was because it was staffed by attorneys. Um, that was responsible for ensuring implementation of those reforms. So if the sheriff said, okay, we will change X or Y. It was the monitor's job to dig in and embed itself in the department and report back to the board um, on uh, progress on those reforms. At the same time, the duty of the monitor uh, was to research best practices from around the country and, and also overseas, uh, in Ireland and the UK in particular, to identify better ways of encountering the community that provided less risk for officers and the public, um, and to work with the department to introduce them uh, you know, to those best practices. Um, so I served as the de as a deputy monitor uh, in that setup from 1993 uh, to 2004. Before I, I, after I accepted a job at the state of Vermont, I ended up resigning and then and then traveling across the country. Uh, when I was in uh, that position as a deputy monitor. Um, the areas that I focused on was citizens' complaints and officer accountability, use of force uh, tactics, de-escalation, crisis intervention, uh, the canine unit and SWAT units, uh, as well as uh, incarceration, the mentally ill. Um, and um, uh, part of that job uh, wasn't just doing document review. Uh, a, a monitor's office uh, really to be effective it has to be enmeshed in the department. So I participated in a, academy and also continuing trainings, including scenario trainings as a role player, as the officer, the hostage, the bystander, or the perpetrator. Uh, I embedded with the canine unit and rode with them to calls. I rode with the gang enforcement team and all of the specialized units so that I could see it from a day-to-day -day uh, operational standpoint, how the department really works. A, a monitoring uh, a monitoring entity that is confined merely to paper review uh, is uh, is sort of like surveying the ocean from from the deck of a, a cruise ship. Uh, so part of the monitoring model, uh, though it sounds it, you know it sounds maybe more like a like an auditor where a lot of it is done by paper. It involves a lot of time that's spent in the department, but also in the community. So we spent a lot of time with all of the community organizations, business leaders, uh, victim advocates and the like. Um, following that work or the start of that work, which started to yield results in Los Angeles, other cities started to notice the work of that monitor's office. Um, so in 1996, the city of Detroit hired uh, the monitor and me to do a, a study of their use of force and accountability systems following the, the murder of, uh, of a Detroiter named Malice Green by two Detroit police officers who were convicted of the murder. It was a beating death and, and, and quite grisly. Uh, we also were asked to then go to different parts of the country and look at their existing or proposed remedies for police, uh, for policing practices or civilian oversight, so that included um, cities like Philadelphia, uh, Burbank, Oakland, uh, Phoenix, Portland, Oregon, uh, and Denver. Uh, in um, 1999, now I'll just try to shorten this up. I don't want to run too long. In 1999, um, the, the U.S. Department of Justice uh, asked me to train its lawyers on how to review police shootings. From the, from the outsider perspective. And then that led to work that I've been doing off and on as an expert for DOJ on a number of cities, uh, including Washington, DC, 
uh, Seattle, Baltimore, Newark, Maricopa County, uh, Arizona, uh, and most recently uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, I worked on an investigation that was completed last year. Um, within the state of Vermont, my, my role is principally in this civil rights unit has been more in the area of hate crimes. I do training with, uh, at the police academy on hate crimes. Um, and uh, so a lot of the expertise, if you can call it that, I, could, I just call it experience and learning, um, comes from a lot of work that I've done in other parts of the state. I have not participated as a monitor or an oversight member for any entity in the state. Uh, I have provided technical assistance from time to time to uh, state police as well as some municipalities on ideas that they are either on uh, you know, issues of investigations or um, models that communities are thinking about uh, for their own version of, of oversight. So, so that's, that's my background. I've never served on a, uh, a, a review board as such. I really, my personal involvement has either to serve as a monitor or deputy monitor myself or be tasked to audit review boards and police departments coming in from the outside to find out what works and what doesn't and to propose fixes to make sure that it's meeting what the community wants uh, them to meet. So I'll stop there if, if there's any questions about that. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions about, who, yeah, Senator Clarkson? Well, <clears throat> after becoming such an expert on all these things, Julio, all over the country, it does, the obvious question is why Vermont? But we can have that offline at another point, but I'd love to hear that story. Oh. Yeah, I mean, the, um, with, with the great indulgence from the two attorneys general that I've served with, they've allowed me to continue to do this work in my off hours. So my vacation time for many years has been spent on these other, these other entities and I'm still engaged on some of those, those projects. So um, it's not something I've, I've, I've surrendered. I mean, I'm still working on those issues with, um, right now, most of it involves either a federal Consent decree monitor. I work for the consent decree monitor for Newark, New Jersey. I'm on the monitoring team. So right. that's a court, that's a court appointed, court appointed position. And then I'm also serving as an expert for DOJ on uh, Baltimore and Mar Maricopa County. Um, wow. So, um, so what, the, there are a few things I, I think I've learned a lot more than I've taught or, or shared during the period of time. And there are a few things that along the way, at least for members who haven't heard testimony on the subject before that uh, are just um, lessons that were learned over time. Um, uh, and there are a few, a, a few kind of key principles uh, to keep in mind. One, the history of civilian oversight in the United States is not a very good history. Uh, there, have been mod there have been different models of civilian review entities we're going on to 50 years in the United States. They all fo follow, or nearly a, all of them follow uh, a familiar birth story, which is that there is some critical flashpoint in a community or in, or sometimes nationally, as happened initially with uh, Rodney King, and we've seen it several, we've seen it several times since then, including uh, uh, what's going on in Minneapolis right now. Uh, and then there are, and usually at the municipal level, there's a rush to create some sort of entity with vaguely defined powers, usually little funding, almost no training. Uh, and then they are tasked to meet once a month and do something, whether that's reviewing completed investigations or taking com uh, civilian complaints and the like. Um, the other story of civilian oversight is that uh, there are constant, there's constant evolution of these entities. So um, the, the cycle of these, and I, and I provided, I think the committee, uh, a, a, a white paper from the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement um, that talks about the history of, of the different models is that uh, they, uh, many of them go through a cycle where 
time passes, um, the entity is forgotten in the public eye, uh, and then additional critical incidents arise and then all eyes are back on that entity, which is found to have been ineffectual. And then there's another, another reform. Um, history teaches us, I think, who work in this area uh, or, and, and people in the communities that have uh, uh, worked in the area of uh, police reform and, and civilian oversight and partnering is that the quick solution doesn't usually work. Uh, and that's especially the case where it is a sort of top down, you know, a proposal where it comes from someone who already works in a city or county government, they come up with an idea or they take an idea from another uh, similarly sized city and then they propose it and then there's a limited period of public comment from the members of the community who are supposed to participate in this model and be served by it. Uh, the more successful efforts have really worked in the opposite way. They are born from ideas that are provided by the community first, that those ideas are, that principles are staked out by the community rather than the government. And then it is the government's role to try to match town and government operations to meet those needs. Um, and, and then, and part of those discussions necessarily include law enforcement since they are going to be the ones who will be governed by and interacting with whatever the civilian oversight entity is. Um, so they can't be excluded from the conversation, but they are, uh, you know, they are a co-producer of public safety. The community is the other co-producer. And so the more successful model or, or uh, approach to developing a model builds up from the community. Uh, and so in connection with the work that we've done here so far in the AG's office, and we're not done, uh, pursuant to Act 166, uh, Chair White, uh, Thank you. Section 16, we were tasked with uh, soliciting input from different community groups uh, you know, and municipalities to talk about what they want, or what they think they can afford what they think they're missing in terms of police accountability. Uh, and as you can expect, if you read the newspapers in the last year and a half, even before uh, the murder of George Floyd last May, um, they were already working at uh, revising or, or, or attacking the issue of accountability uh, to make sure that the police are serving um, the agenda or meeting the agenda that the community really sets. Um, and so we've seen in the last year efforts, obviously in Burlington and in Brattleboro, we've seen it in smaller towns uh, like Bennington or Virgins, where communities are themselves doing the research uh, and trying to identify what, it, what fits their organization. And it's important as, as you, the chair noted at the outset is that the size of police departments in Vermont is, varies widely. Um, there are departments that have two officers and many departments that have fewer than a dozen officers. And so the capacity for a town to build some or to invest in some larger structure to govern a dozen officers or fewer uh, isn't really, uh, you know, isn't really or historically hasn't been viewed as an economical way to approach it. And so the default position in Vermont has been that it is the town managers usually, or the town select board, uh, that are the ones who are expected to uh, cast an eye on, say, an investigation uh, of a complaint or a critical force incident. And in many cases, they don't have any training or support in the area of law enforcement. Um, so uh, they're at a serious disadvantage when it comes to evaluating, uh, you know, as an honest neutral broker, um, you know, what, what the circumstances are. Uh, and also uh, they're at a disadvantage to know what alternatives to um, uh, conflict, you know, or encounters in conflict situation that are available to the department. It may be that the department or an officer follows a policy 
but the problem may be with the policy itself. And historically, Vermont, it's no different than many other states, towns and municipal, towns and cities have individuals that just don't have that sort of background. Um, and so that's that's kind of the problem statement um, that, that exists right now. Um, so I could stop right there before I start talking about the individual models, if there are questions, because I don't want to get ahead of anybody or myself here. Does anybody have any questions right now? I, I would um, just um, in thinking about whether we call it citizen oversight or review or what, whatever we call end up calling it is what what really is the the function of of the committee is it just to review allegations of misconduct is it to, I, I mean I think that it's important to under for people to understand what 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 the breadth of the responsibility is and Great and um, how that gets defined? That's a great question. There really is no limit on uh, what a community's participation in law enforcement is. And that's the way historically I viewed it is not merely oversight in uh, policing, but par participation in public safety. Uh, there are many models. Um, sometimes it's in a police commission model uh, sometimes it's in the monitor model where uh, the community has direct input on the policies themselves, that they identify existing policies, do research uh, on what are national best practices, maybe consult or engage that experts, but also define for themselves what sort of police responses they want for certain types of calls. Um, and so, uh, for example, the, uh, at Brattleboro in January, it released a large, a large report. Uh, it was a major undertaking for Brattleboro, where, where a very useful section of the report, uh, we don't have time today to go over it in any detail, but um, the community's review of their own policies identified uh, what, what they viewed as systemic biases towards confrontation, towards an aggressive model of policing, towards, uh, you know, that basically captured a mindset that according to the authors of the report didn't really align with what the community was expecting its police to do. Um, there are many uh, models of, uh, or, or many cities that have civilian entities that are responsible for providing that input and approving <clears throat> policies that uh, that serve the community. So it's not just complaints, it's the very policies themselves. Okay. Senator Clarkson. Thank you, Julio. I think um, our, our chair has also touched on this. I think you're right. It, 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 I think it seems to be much more effective if it's community engagement and it's not just responding to complaints or responding to th bad, awful things happening. It, it's really proactively addressing what is community's engagement with its public safety? What does it want? What does it need? Um, and and how do they want, how do they see, how do they envision it? How does it help further the vision and, and, and goals of the community? Yeah, I mean, for example, when I worked on the Seattle consent decree, so I, in that one, I worked for uh, the court appointed monitor. So we were, the consent decree is overseen by a federal judge. And then uh, in that case, he appointed a team of uh, individuals with experience in police reform to oversee and monitor the Seattle Police Department's changes in, um, in how it was going to comply with constitutional policing and, and meet the community standards. A big issue in Seattle when we started, I think I started that in late 2013 was there were certain areas in Seattle, certain parks or squares that were frequented by individuals or maybe were the homes of individuals who really uh, were not supported a, a, by any of the existing systems for mental health or housing. And uh, a study which we oversaw to, to identify 
the amount of 911 calls or police calls for service for these areas where there were only a few dozen in individuals that were accounting for many hundreds of calls and many you know by different officers all the time uh, and so the community uh, uh, they have they have a community council there that uh, you know that offers recommendations for policing and they were very supportive of the creation of a unit of officers with a background in, 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 in mental health uh, and social work to be assigned to those areas so that they be, they knew uh, after a period of time, all of the people who occupied those areas. And, the, and so those officers knew the, the, the individuals, the residents, uh, the community members and vice versa. And in most of the cases, uh, where, where there was you know, some public disturbance or nuisance, uh, it related to medication or housing issues. Uh, and their job wasn't really to show up with the handcuffs, but to make the calls and cut through some of the red tape in the city to get those individuals back in treatment uh, you know, in a safe place at night uh, where they, you know, they could avoid risk from other, you know, other, uh, uh, other members of, of the community. Uh, that was dictated by the community. It was saying, you know, why do we, why should we have these same couple dozen individuals encounter over the period of a year, maybe 20 or 30 patrol officers who don't know anything about them. They just show up and it's just another guy uh, who lives in the park rather than investing the time to have uh, the, the department's employees zero in on these people, almost become de de facto caseworkers or work with their existing caseworkers so they could meet those needs and get some of them, uh, as many as they could off the streets and, and certainly in treatment uh, where they needed both you know, medical attention and really rehabilitative services. So that was an example of a agenda set, a setting that came directly from the community and the department, which was under a consent decree um, and had a new chief who was very effective, uh, Kathleen O'Toole, former uh, chief of the Boston Police Department, they were very, very receptive for that. It was a win-win for the department because what they found is once they made that small investment, then the volume of the 911 call started to decrease. And the use of force in, in uh, where individuals would have to be removed from a scene because they presented a risk to themselves or others, the uses of force were cut by roughly 75%. It was really remarkable because uh, the people arriving at the scene didn't come with an arrest or use of force mindset. They came there uh, more as uh, with a guardian or a caregiver rather than a warrior mindset. And so uh, when they arrive at the scene, it was all about helping that individual rather than forcefully removing that individual or commanding them to leave and then using force if, if they resisted. Uh, so that's that's just one example, um, and it's been it's been utilized in other cities. That's just one I have uh, some experience in you know seeing how that program developed. So agenda agenda setting and policy is one of those areas, and related to that is uh, community uh, input into training, officer training, um, to um, not merely to comment on officer behavior after it happens but to make the investment up front to see whether they are um, training their officers to engage in confrontation. Um, and so, uh, you know, that if you have a, having civilian or community input means that they should be welcome to review. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be secretive in most cases, I mean, some SWAT-like tactics you don't want publicly disclosed for, for safety reasons, but uh, in general, you know, to, for the public or the community to be able to see firsthand what the training is, participate in it uh, and watch officers run through it and, and then see, you know, whether their approach matches up with what the community's expectations are. Um, so, you know, when I started in, um, doing this, uh, you know, ages ago, uh, one of the more frustrating areas of, um, of police encounters would be an officer's encounter 
with someone usually in crisis who had an edged weapon. So they had a knife or they had a broken bottle. They had an umbrella. They had some sharpened object that presented, you know, with a deadly weapon and no question, it was something that if uh, they were able to strike out at somebody could cause serious injury. Um, and, um, you know, most of the training in most of the United States, the paradigm was all about uh, appropriate distance and getting the firearm out, getting it in the low ready position because the teaching at the time was, was to demonstrate how quickly someone could close the gap. There was a famous 21 foot rule that came out of a, a trainer from Salt Lake City, Utah, where they were trying to demonstrate for officer safety purposes that someone could close the 21 foot gap before mm -hmm. an officer could on holster point and, and, and fire to defend themselves. It was very little focus on things like backing up or moving so that there was an obstacle like a car or a table between the person with the weapon and the officer. Um, and um, it was really only, uh, I mean, it was a very, there's been very slow progress, but progress on getting officers to focus on de-escalation that every minute you spend talking to someone um, with a weapon and they're talking to you and they're not using the weapon is a victory for that officer to allow other officers to arrive. If there's family members that need to be, uh, you know, at a distance, at a safe distance that can help in the de-escalation, um, then they could do that. But um, you, you you would see the results. And when I did monitoring, you could see the results on the street. The officers were just following what they'd been trained. And in a high stress situation, uh, any professional, it's not just police officers, uh, it's EMTs, it's airplane pilots, um, it's um, you know air traffic controllers. When they're in a high stress situation, they don't have much time to think. They will resort to their training uh, it is what's most available to them. Uh, and so participation in training, if you have the right training and the training in, in, in an edge weapon encounter is time, distance, and talk, um, then that's what they will start to fall, uh, uh, fall back on rather than uh, tactical position on holster, low ready position. Because once the gun is out, the officer's options are very limited. Mm -hmm. Now the gun is, it's, it's an asset for the officer, but it's also a liability because it's a deadly weapon that the officer might lose in the fight. Uh, so once it's out of the holster, the officer has narrowed a lot of their options. Certainly de-escalation is almost certainly off the page because no one reacts, almost no one reacts positively if they're in crisis to seeing a drawn gun. And if the person closes with the officer, they would have to reholster and go downward to maybe use pepper spray or just to put their hands out to create distance. So resorting to that gun sort of traps the officer into a very narrow range of choices. And if, the tr and if that's the officer's training, then you'll get those predictable res results. And so exposing it and, you know, transparency on training to get a fresh eye from the outside um, to see how you know, if they do scenarios, what do the scenarios look like? Do the scenarios always have the bad guy uh, that's always a male, that's always a, a person of color, you know, those sort of examples. It trains officers to, to disregard risks that might be pre presented to them by white females, for example, um, where they might, their training examples are just, if there's a group and there are shots fired, I'm gonna focus on, on the male um, as a potential threat. And that's dangerous, not only to those individuals, but that's dangerous to the officer because they may be zeroing in on the wrong person. So that focus on the outside look and training can be very, very valuable and start to uh, slow down the pace, if not eliminate uh, the sorts of bad outcomes on the street. So I'll, st I'll so stop there. I noticed that I think Senator Rahm had a question. Yeah, I mean, you know, Julio, before we go on to the models, I hear you defining the problem statement, but kind of taking the same statement you just made and extrapolating it out, when there's a crisis, 
in a community around their level of trust of the police, that's often when the police stop wanting to listen and hear what that crisis of trust is coming from the community. So I'm really curious how you and the attorney general's office are working with police departments around the state to be at the table in equal relationship with the communities that they serve. Because I, you know, I hear a lot of police officers, frankly, saying, well, we want to hear the community, but you know, we want to, we want to sit down at the table with them and they still want to be at the head of the table. I don't think they really know what it looks like to truly be in equitable relationship with the communities they serve and have civilian oversight and have that conversation. So I am I feel a lot of defensiveness from law enforcement agencies, yeah. and that's not a good place to start these conversations. It doesn't build trust. So how are you helping them define the problem statement? Because we can't get to all these models until they are willing to sit down with the community and see that they have a problem with trust. And well, I'm gonna follow up with that, just to, if I might. I, I believe that um, one of the weaknesses that was pointed out, and I may be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure I'm right, in the Brattleboro study that was done was that um, law enforcement was not allowed at the table at all. There was no communication there. So that was the other side of what Keisha's um, um, alluding to here is that you need to have both and they need to be equal partners. Um, yeah, there's actually, what, so I could talk to some examples. I mean, the, you both have defined the issue perfectly. There is, there is inevitably um, resistance and fear uh, when there's any kind of reform of an organization. Uh, and that's true of law enforcement uh, as well. I, I could talk about some historically or examples that I've seen where, or how those fears manifest themselves. And, uh, you know, to note success stories or, or failures. Um, on the issue of participation, for example, in Seattle and in a different committee in the Judiciary Committees, I've been testifying with others about the use of force policies and things like that. Uh, a lot of folks have been um, looking at use of force policies that really have spread out from Seattle. Seattle has, or is viewed as having one of the more robust use of force policies in the country. Um, I'm very familiar with that because I was working on that with the police department and the community and, and the unions. Um, in Seattle, uh, I think the agency um, uh, or, and the city was very focused on participating with the community and very focused on dealing with the monitor because I had to, frankly, they're under a court order. Um, but I think the reports that, that came out was that there wasn't that much input with the officers union uh, about what the changes were going to be. Um, and as a consequence, or, or certainly related to that, shortly after the policy was issued, I think it was 110 officers filed a lawsuit uh, to enjoin the policy to and, and to make arguments in court about why this policy uh, was inappropriate and put officers at risk. Um, uh, the, the lawsuit did not have merit uh, on the law uh, and it was ultimately dismissed but it was an example of the sort of a failure, a process follow, if you will, that was committed during the development process where not everybody felt like they had an equal voice. A lot of these officers sued on their own just because they themselves felt threatened and thought that options that they would use uh, to save their lives if they were in, in high risk situations were being removed. And that was very motivating to them. Um, so you're right that everyone has to be at the table. The one, one of the more successful use of force policies in the last two years that's been developed uh, came, out, came out of Camden County, New Jersey, uh, when Scott Thompson was the head of, head of that department. And their use of force policy, which is viewed as, you know, you know again, one of the, 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 the standout policies in the country was a project between uh, New York <laughs> University's policing project, uh, the local ACLU and NAACP chapters, and the Fraternal Order of Police. 
that they were all, they, it, there was community involvement as well, but everyone worked together. So when the policy was at its final stage to be presented uh, to the county government, the, you know, the rank and file and the, uh, the, uh, the officer unions had, had provided their input, uh, as had, again, other community stakeholders. So you're absolutely right that a successful outcome requires all voices there. Um, so how do you, how do you, how do you get to that point? How do you, how do you um, convince the, the law enforcement officers that the community needs to have an equal voice and they need to be there? And how do you convince the community that the law enforcement needs to be there at the table also? And, and how do you choose, I guess, uh, uh, which community members you're talking with and which police officers you're talking with? Because you, I mean, is it leadership in the police department that, I, I don't know if, I guess I think we're getting into a little <laughs> into more detail here. And I, what I'm um, going to suggest is that we continue this conversation for maybe 15 more minutes okay. because we have, I believe we have um, the ethics um, walkthrough at two, at two. Am I right about that? Um, Gail, is that right? 2.30. Oh, 2.30. Okay. So we, we have until 2.30. So let's, um, but I think we're, we're going to continue this conversation again at another time also. So um, thank you. Thank you, Senator Collimore. I was getting a little nervous here, but okay. Thanks. So uh, there are a couple of issues that I identified. I, we're not in a position really to recommend a given model yet. And part of that is that the community input process for us is not done. It's not close to being done. A, a key ingredient for a successful change is that you have to spend the time. It's, it's a slow moving process because you need to provide multiple opportunities for the community. It's harder to get the community's input because they're so diverse. It's not that hard to get a city attorney and a police chief in a room, but it's harder to get members of the community, particularly those who are afraid of their police departments mm -hmm. in the room or in a group setting. So it's more time consuming, but you have to invest that time, not only at the beginning, but as policies or training are being drafted, you have to provide multiple opportunities for people to take a look at that. Um, so that's, that's part of it. And that contact, if it's a respectful inter interaction, I find, um, uh, helps the relationship, time spent in the room, when people realize that the that the people who are on quote the opposite side, you know don't don't have uh, you know don't have a pitchfork and tail that kind of thing that you're talking with individuals that that it, the personal interaction and regular interaction is really important. Yes, Senator Colmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. So one of the things that this committee and the legislature in general seems to struggle with, and I don't know that there's a right answer to this, is to get a sweet spot in terms of the number of people that you involve in this type of, of situation. You know, you reach a point where if you get to 15, 16, 20, you, there's too many people to actually be able to get a lot of stuff done. But if you don't involve enough, you risk leaving an important voice out of the process too. Right. What, what have uh, you discovered, uh, Julio, in terms of sort of hitting that sweet spot in terms of the number of people involved? Yeah, um, there, there's really, I mean, in terms of the community involvement and in all the projects I've worked on with their changes of policies, for example, there'll be a draft policy that is posted for, pub, for public comment for a period of months uh, there might be public meetings to go through that policy. It's almost like rulemaking, like a rulemaking, a proposed rule and a comment period. Um, in terms of organizational interactions, you know, the community organizations are really vital because there will be people there who are, who might have training or experience in the area. So they come to the table with knowledge or they come with models that they've gotten from, uh, you know, sister uh, organizations. Um, 
But those individuals are also going back to their constituency and they need to have the opportunity to be there with, without you in the room. So if, you know, like in, um, it won't say that I won't name names, but we might be talking about a policy with somebody who represents a local NAACP chapter. And then they're gonna go back and talk to a whole bunch of people without you in the room so that they can have that candid discussion without, you know, wondering what, you know, you might say or think about them, even as an outsider where, you know, I was, I might be somebody from another state. So uh, just to give them that ability. So using those organizations as conduits and also giving them advance notice of what you're going to talk about so that um, before you, let's say you would meet with NAACP, for example, um, if there was a draft or an outline, you'd send it to them in advance and give them time to go talk with the community and get their input again on their own, fully candid without you, so that when they met you, they were ready to talk. They weren't just kind of reacting in the moment and not having an opportunity to get that advanced feedback. And that's part of what slows it down a little bit. Um, but you really do get very, very meaningful input that way. Um, places that don't, that don't follow that, um, typically we'll have policies that will go out um, and that will generate uh, un unintended results for everybody, for the community and the department. And then they have to go back and change that policy or the training uh, and involve more people. So it's better to get it right at the outset. Um, Thank you. Uh, and so um, like in some of the consent decrees I've worked on, People are involved in the proposal, the drafting, you know, like multiple red lines. There's public posting where you get written comments um, uh, that, and the people who are more involved in the drafting process from the community and the agency work on that. And then again, there's public, there's community meetings that are led by community members who will explain, let me tell you what this policy is gonna be about, um, you know, say, police dogs, like some city might have issues with officer use of canines for, for searches or high risk arrests, you know, where someone's in an attic in a burglary and they need a police dog uh, to identify somebody, how to do that safely. And so they'll present what the policy is gonna be. We're gonna keep the dogs on leash. It's a find and bark policy rather than a find and bite uh, policy and explain it to them and then get that additional input. I've never seen the public input you know, in the near final draft that didn't elicit really good ideas that everyone missed at the beginning. Uh, it's inevitable. Um, so it can be time consuming, but it's really, really valuable. And, um, and it really does help people feel more ownership from the agency side, but also the community side in that policy. Um, and what's, what inevitably happens is that you, um, is that you have to then launch the policy and train on the policy and then have a community commitment. You're gonna come back in the next year to see what changes you need to make. Because once you, because experience will generate situations where you think we didn't quite capture what we needed to do. We need to make tweaks or adjustments. Uh, and you just need to accept that. Um, and for any good, you know, um, for any good, let's say de-escalation or use of force uh, policy and training. If you look at, if you go on the web and look at the versions of the documents, you'll see it's like version seven or version nine, because there will inevitably be situations that arise that people didn't think about and say, okay, you know, our, our model for handling something like uh, a call where someone's in a position of self-harm uh, in, in a residence that, it's, it's not meeting what's actually happening in the community. Um, and you just have to be open about that. Police leadership obviously is important, but so is community leadership. What's really vital, I just wanna say this, just to get this in, because it was in, it was in, the, uh, in the Brattleboro report. I was, I was happy to see it. Um, they, they quoted a passage from um, uh, a study done by the Police Assessment Resource Center in Los Angeles, uh, where, where I worked from 2002 to 2004, 
that emphasize the really critical need for the government, uh, the governmental entity to provide training support for any members of the community who are participating in the policy development or oversight. A principal concern, it's not just, it doesn't happen in policing. It happens, uh, it happens with engineers. It happens in the airline industry. But there's always a concern where professionals are subject to oversight by individuals they don't feel understand the profession. They don't understand, and this happens in medicine. It happens in law. Uh, it, happens, it happens in teaching where individuals wanna make sure that those who are involved with evaluating performance or evaluating policy are themselves at least well, you know, fairly well acquainted with how the occupation actually works. Uh, and, a, and a longstanding failure for a lot of civilian oversight entities is they say, okay, we're gonna get five community members. They're gonna represent these con constituencies and these individuals, it's good to get a broad selection. You have somebody who works in real estate, somebody who's a basketball coach, someone who's a substance abuse counselor. Um, and then they're kind of thrown in there and they don't know what the rules are regarding searches after an arrest. They don't know um, whether you know an existing strip search policy meets the constitutional standard or not, or whether um, you know there are better practices out that afford uh, that keep safety in mind, but also for afford people more dignity. And so the Brattleboro report, I think, really zeroed in on an essential need. Whatever is the outcome here is that there do need to be supports and resources for training uh, uh, opportunities so that uh, board members are acquainted so that they can be effective. The, Brat the part of the uh, Brattleboro report found that where they've done studies of those reports that don't have the training over time, the, the, the community uh, oversight, so to speak, ends up agreeing with the department 90% or more of the time. Now, I can't say whether that's the right percentage, but what, what, you know, what academic and other studies have, have shown is that the lack of knowledge works to the disadvantage of the community in terms of its effectiveness, but it also, is an impediment to trust from law enforcement because a rank and file may recognize that the people who are evaluating their work aren't familiar with the occupation, aren't familiar with the law, the many laws, the many regulations that apply to the profession. So it doesn't really help anyone if um, you don't provide those supports. And so I think looking down the road, again, we're quite a way, I think, away from offering our final views on this, but it's hard to imagine a situation where um, you would have an effective, uh, you would have an effective entity or entities of any form where they didn't have access and may, perhaps a mandate uh, for training to make sure people are um, experienced enough so that they can become better issue spotters and better problem solvers because they're more familiar with the subject matter on the job training it historically has not been a very effective way of, of uh, increasing the quality of um, community participation and oversight. So I'll stop there if there's a question about that. Senator Rahm. Well, actually, Julio, when you were talking, I was thinking about uh, the year that I was arrested as a teenager by the LAPD for absolutely nothing, and it was 2003. Um, so I wish I could say that I think the LAPD has improved um, but the on the ground experience for black and brown people would unfortunately tell me otherwise. And that's kind of what I wanted to ask about. It, it's, it's gravely harmful for people of color to have to come out and say, this is not okay and I am not okay and the police are not doing their jobs properly. We just saw that in Bennington again um, with a, a couple coming forward having been given tickets 12 times in 20 something days, feeling like they were being run out of town by a lot of decision makers. It, it extracts a lot of pain and resources from people of color to have to speak up and go on the record saying that, that they are being harmed by the police and to file those complaints. And then nothing happens with them half the time. So I'm just, I'm really like, I, I appreciate everything you're saying, but I'm not hearing what the attorney general's office is doing to improve the situation. And I really wanna make it specific to what are we doing? Not 
what can we do? What would be ideal? But we are having a problem in Vermont and we need to know what the attorney general is doing about it. Well, <clears throat> uh, it's a great question. Under, under Vermont law, including Act 166, we don't have any authority over law enforcement reform other than mm -hmm. criminal prosecution. We have representation on the Criminal Justice Council. We have one seat on that council. Uh, we don't have the ability like the Human Rights Commission does to do a civil investigation of racial profiling and the like. So um, we've been tasked in this law to get input, not only from law, law enforcement, but from a, a broad range of Vermonters uh, in different organizations to hear about what they want in terms of increased accountability mechanisms. So that's our job under 166 uh, is, is to get that information and offer some recommendations or ideas to the legislature. Um, along the way, we certainly interact with law enforcement and members of the council uh, to identify um, instances or problems that they're trying to solve. But we don't have a legal charge to do that. Um, that's not, I mean, we don't, I can't, I can't make a police chief anywhere sit down to talk with me uh, or answer to me or, or produce files for my review. We don't have that. I mean, one of the things we'll be talking about later as this, as this project develops are models of oversight that include that kind of authority. For example, uh, you may be aware the House uh, passed the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act. And uh, one provision of that law allows state attorneys general to conduct pattern and practice investigations very much like the DOJ does uh, for police departments where they investigate whether an agency is, you know, kind of chronically, systemically discriminating against the community. Uh, Vermont doesn't give us that authority. Most states do not have that authority. Congress is proposing it uh, in a bill right now that's before the Senate. Senator Clarkson. Uh, thank you. So Julio, given that you feel you need further time to make a recommendation on community engagement or community oversight model, whatever we're going to call it. Uh, I would hope it would have a more proactive name. Um, when do you feel you have that in time for us to take action here or later this session, uh, this summer? When do you think you'll actually have that work to, uh, done enough to make a recommendation? I would say my best projection is it's probably going to run into the summer in part, we, we, and I'm very proud of this, but there's been a lot of work right now in communities in getting certain underserved communities vaccinated. Um, and so there's been a lot of energy that's been devoted to that, uh, which I think is terrific. Um, but I think we still have a lot of work to do. There are lots of folks in towns we want to talk to, um, and that's going to be on you know, in smaller sessions, but also we anticipate having, you know, a number of, I assume for most of them, there'll be uh, Zoom-based uh, town hall kind of meetings. Uh, and then also soliciting, um, uh, you know, written input from organizations. And We're also talking, by the way, uh, and I'm a real believe in that, believer in this, if you're thinking about creating an organization that uh, or building up an organization that engages in oversight, uh, go talk to the professionals who do that. Uh, so for example, Monday, I'm talking to a lawyer who right now works for the Pennsylvania Attorney General, but uh, she worked for years as an investigator in the Office of Police Complaints in Washington, DC, and then the parallel office in New York City. And she's agreed, by the way, to talk to some of uh, the Vermont cities and towns about her experience so she can tell you, you know, what were her frustrations as an investigator under a given system. I think that's really one of the best ways to do it. So we're getting that sort of uh, input uh, from people who are either experts or people who work in, in the field. Uh, may I just so, uh, follow up? Yep. Which is, if you haven't done one in uh, Windsor County or Eastside, I'd love to be in, I mean, if it was appropriate, I'd love to be invited to one of those. Oh, of course. 
What? Of course. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, but I mean, have you and has any have any of the rest of my colleagues on this committee been invited to join one of those? It what? I don't think you know the the person who uh, on this project I'm working with, Dave Share, Assistant Attorney General, David Share, who I think you've met before uh, on more than one occasion. Um, yeah, so Dave has, has been more the one dealing like with a lot of the scheduling. So I can't, I'm not really, uh, you know, familiar with like what the latest details are. But, but what I've been saying when I have been talking to folks is that we're going to talk to you more than once. Um, it's not enough uh, to, you know, meet with somebody for a half an hour or give them five minutes in a town hall. Because what happens is we go on to the next group we get their ideas and then we want to go back to the first folks and say, hey, yeah, this is an issue we overlooked. What do you think about that? Um, so it's it's very it's very involved and there'll be multiple opportunities. Uh, any of the you know, any of the events that we do with communities. Um, everybody's going to be invited from that. I mean, we're going to try to you know, arrange speakers who are from that community, um, but it's going to be available uh, to everyone. And um, There'll be multiple opportunities because we're never tired of hearing from people. I mean, it's really, really important. It is, uh, you know, there's a lot of research to be done about existing entities and, and that sort of stuff. And we've done a lot of that, but it's really hearing what the communities want because the, they they have very different views about what they want. And I, before I go to you, Senator Clarkson, I, I just, I think we need to be really careful about, um, and this just jumped out at me when uh, Senator Clarkson, when you said, I hope we can have a more proactive name or, or some, something like that you said. And I don't, I think that we need to acknowledge that what we have in Vermont is many, many different types of communities. So we have approximately, um, 65 or 70 town municipalities that actually have police departments. We have about 180 towns that don't have police departments. So whatever, what, what um, Dummerston does in terms of its public safety and how it's going to respond to public safety is going to be very, very different than Brattleboro. Brattleboro can have some kind of a community involvement, community oversight, whatever it is. Dummerston has nothing to oversee because they don't have a police department. They don't have, so I, I think we need to be very careful about thinking that whatever we come up with, some, some places may call it a citizen review committee. Some places may call it um, a public safety advisory committee or, so I, I just wanted to point that out that we need to be really careful that we're not we're not thinking that um, there's going to be something here that's going to solve solve this. And then I I think we need to also make sure that when we're having these conversations, and particularly around investigating um, disciplinary actions, that kind of thing that we remember that we have a whole new criminal justice council that has a really, really active right now investigation subcommittee that is made up of <clears throat> mostly non-law enforcement people, some law enforcement people on there also. So we need to be really careful that we don't set up something that is going to um, conflict with with that, um, they've worked, they're working very hard, the community representatives on there to make sure that they're setting up the right kind of investigative um, uh, oversight of, and, and so I, I just think we need to, it, it's more, it's much more complicated than just um, having Brattleboro set up some kind of a, a an oversight committee. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more fully, um, but I think it goes back two years to our tour of the of the state and to our thinking broadly about how do communities envision uh, uh, public safety in their communities, whether they have a police department or not. I mean, they have a vision. Uh, I bet if you ask people in Dumberston or if you ask people in Reading or 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 you know. 
Mount Holly, places that don't have police departments, but that I bet they have a, a, a if they if there was a group of people that came together to talk about what's your vision for your public safety? How do you envision? I mean, I, I think it's a bigger, I wasn't wanting to be prescriptive at all. I, I actually think it goes to our questions from two years ago, which is how does, what's a community's vision for its own public safety? Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. And one of the things that we are going to hear is the inventory that we've asked um, the planning commissions to do on how many how many towns actually have public safety plans and what right. what is constituted in those plans. So we will we will be hearing from them about that inventory. Um, so, but it, it this the whole um, I think that the really in my mind here the important thing is to be getting the community. And I'm talking here about the broad community with uh, representing all aspects of its community and the public safety people um, to be able to come together and talk. And, and some, there might be different things in different communities growing out of that conversation. And in some, they, they may, they, I, I just think that that is the most crucial thing is to get people to sit down together and and begin to uh, form that trust <coughs> so that they really can talk about what what are some of the issues here and how do we approach them and how do we um, and and not necessarily even the the community group coming up with the policy but Here's what we expect. Here's 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 how we would like to see things happen in our community, and from that grows the policy, not the policy. Anyway, I'll be I'll be quiet now, Senator Rom. Well, I mean, we should probably let Julio talk a little bit more. <laughs> and in in some yeah. of the sort of final thoughts, I was I was just wondering. Um, I imagine with most models, as you said, some towns have money for this, and some don't, and. We've had started this conversation in this committee, you know, regardless of the source of funding, I think the state needs to help the communities who don't have the resources have these conversations in a way that people are able to participate, which costs money. I can't imagine one of these models is free and effective at the same time. No, they're not. And, and you know, historically, that's where that's where state government has lent its hand most civilian oversight entities when you're talking about oversight of non-state law enforcement, so cities and towns, their law or counties, their law enforcement, um, the state doesn't, uh, doesn't have that much of a hand. It typically has a hand, and Vermont already has some of that. Vermont has a human rights commission. Anyone who alleges a, a discrimination by any government agency, state or local, you go to the Human Rights Commission, which has subpoena power, has the ability to take the department or agency to court, whether that's law enforcement or any other government. We also have law enforcement certification uh, where officers, their quote, license to, you know, to practice policing uh, is subject to revocation or suspension. Uh, in the last year, <clears throat> where states have, have taken legislative action, that's one area, which is that they've increased the role or the powers or authority of the licensing entity to investigate or take actions on officers who are engaging in actions either of excessive force or discriminatory policing. So that there's not only a consequence within the agency, whether they're disciplined or not, but their ability to practice the profession, as it were, may be an issue in, in you know, critical cases as well. I think another area that you're going to see, again, I can't, I can't see the future is like what we're ultimately going to say, but it's hard for me to imagine that, uh, and we haven't seen anybody who's spoken uh, in opposition to it, but where the state could really benefit is to provide the kind of training support or resources for people. We have a state policing academy. We don't have any sort of entity for training or uh, 
and, and skills building for people who are already right now engaged in law enforcement oversight. Uh, they are sort of on their own in terms of uh, training. There are organizations like NACOL, which I've mentioned, uh, that do provide training. I've done some of those trainings uh, at, at the national conferences, but it's not really enough. It's very, it's very episodic and it's not tailored to you know, the city or town or the state. So that's, that's one area I could see where there'll be more discussions about whether the state can provide those supports so that someone who's looking at a, a use of force complaint in you know, Northwest Vermont is applying similar skills and procedures and checklists or things like that as someone who's in you know, the Southern part of the state, that they have a common understanding of what, uh, one of the challenges really for these, I mean, it's, it's kind of a details thing, but I think it's a good illustration is that when, when you have an entity that might be looking at the department or someone's investigation of a critical incident, everyone can read what's in the file, um, but you have to have some training or experience to know what's not in the file that should be in the file. You don't know what you don't know, or you don't know what's, what's missing unless you have exposure to that. Um, and so, um, for, you know, I mentioned earlier that I did this training for DOJ way back, I think it was in 99, about reviewing police shootings. We did a case study of a police or shooting investigation that a lot of the lawyers in, in civil rights division thought was pretty good, but there were big gaps in the investigation, you know, things that were not in the, in the investigation that one would expect to be in a, in a deadly force investigation that weren't there. And many of the people in the room because they weren't familiar with that sort of that project of reviewing a shooting case, they didn't know what was missing. So what they saw looked good, but the problems were what wasn't in the investigation, what wasn't investigated, what wasn't analyzed. And you can't really know that just by being a good reader. Uh, you have to have some experience or some training about what are the what are the essential components of a good you know a good and fair investigation? I think when we're talking about training here, I, I just it just dawned on me that I think we have to differentiate between what a a, a Brattleboro or a Putney or a St Albans oversight committee would have the ability to investigate and and review as opposed to the council. The, yeah, the investigate right. because I'm not sure that that um, we I, I don't know if what we want is for the Brattleboro Advisory Committee or whatever they end up calling themselves to be investigating a deadly shooting um, right. because they they haven't had the training and I don't know that we can provide that to 250 towns. But we can provide really extensive training to the people who are on the investigation committee at the council. And, and, and it seems to me that um, we're, we're talking, mostly what we're, we seem to be focusing on is investigations of police conduct by these, um, that's, that we keep going back to that, to investigations. But I think that they need to be far more than that. And maybe the investigations happen elsewhere than at the community level. It's, it's a very good point. And I didn't mean to suggest at all that we would want to train, you know, a, uh, a couple of, you know, select board members on how to do, how to become deadly force experts. I didn't want to suggest that at all. I was just using it as an example of even people who are well-trained uh, and, you know, very careful uh, analytically, if they don't have training, they will still right. miss things. Yeah. Part of part of oversight models are not just investigating. That's the most expensive model where you have right. you build a new investigative entity. There are other ones that review completed investigations. The monitor auditor um, model. They don't. They're not decision makers on individual cases. What they do is they look for systemic failures. Mm -hmm. They look for so they might like. They might say, I'm going to look at, you know, the last 10 use of force investigations you've done to see whether you are investigating those cases fairly or not. 
to identify problems uh, or suggest best practices or learn lessons. If there's an agency that's doing something really great uh, to share that, um, you know, with other, with other uh, county or, you know, neighboring towns. So that's, that's part of the auditor model uh, as well. Like the commission model is one that's more involved in policy and may have some role in the say of discipline. These are all big issues and, um, they, and not every community agrees about the role or the, the investment that they want to make. But for the ones that are gonna invest in a particular type of model locally, for them to be able to go somewhere or have a resource in the state of Vermont is really, really helpful because there are, there are a lot of people out there who are online consultants who offer training that may not even fit Vermont, Vermont's view of law enforcement. So it's very hard to, to zero in on quality. So like I said, going back to what uh, Senator Rahm said a while ago, I think that you're definitely gonna see a need for supports by the states because the localities just won't have those resources. And it also helps to have some sort of uniformity um, to, to have people have a common basis for training and to cross train. So uh, I think that when you have communities where people in, who are participating in policing in one community know their counterparts for other communities so that everybody knows what they're doing and they're learning from each other because they will all encounter many of the same issues. Uh, they might be dealing with issues of race, poverty, mental illness, homelessness, um, as well as um, uh, uh, law enforcement's role, if any, in the schools. Um, and so to have some, some common uh, source of information, I think is probably gonna prove to be very helpful. But we don't know the details of that because we're still listening to folks. And we're happy to talk to, to any of you or anybody you recommend as much as possible. Um, the, the, the emphasis here is that it's multiple conversations with a lot of people. Right. Any questions or comments? No, go, go. Okay. good luck as you continue. Okay. And. Uh, I, I, if you do anything on this side, I'd love to be a fly on the wall. Um, oh, definitely, sure. And Matt. Okay, anything else? You're muted, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to suggest that um, we take a five minute break. Yippee. That we come back and that we schedule Julio in maybe two weeks to just come back and give us an update again um, and also talk about the issue of the central reporting um, point yeah. and whether you've um, had any, made any headway on that, yeah, on that definitely. issue. And, sure. and maybe when, um, when you come in next time, we can have somebody from the council and maybe a couple people from the, the community members on the council to join us um, in the conversation. That's a great idea. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you, Julio. Thank you. As all. always, you. very oh, informative. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the attention. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break.